some youth groups, they don't even know what apologetics is or that there is a, a study of how to, of, of giving reasons for the faith um, and of answering objections that have come up. They don't even know the great history mm -hmm. of the Christian tradition of answering these objections. So I think it's important to, you know, where do we start with them, with these students? This is a good resource. Unapologetic from Premier Unbelievable. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the show and Unapologetic is all about bringing you into contact with great Christian thinkers, evangelists, apologists and you're going to meet one this week and in the next few weeks as well. Mary Jo Sharp is an assistant professor of apologetics at Houston Baptist University, the founder of the Confident Christianity Apologetics Ministry and author of Why I Still Believe. In fact, I interviewed her unbelievable uh, a couple of years ago on that book she's also the creator of a brand new resource called dark room it's a video website of stories conversations and questions uh, you can find it at darkroomfaith.com and there's a link from today's show but before we jump into that it's time to say hello mary Jo. um how how are you doing <laughs> i'm doing rather well thank you for having me back on the show oh it's great to have you back um it's been a a couple of years at least two and a half or more probably close to three since we saw each other back out in california you very kindly came out to a conference i was hosting uh, in costa mesa um so how, how have the last uh, nearly three years treated you as you've weathered covid and so on <laughs> fairly well i mean i ended up having covid which was not fun as most people know <laughs> uh who've experienced it and then um you know that we we did a lot more online as far as speaking engagements and such so i sort of miss being around the people at the conferences so but coming you know we're coming back into that starting to go do more events and conferences and and that's wonderful love seeing Great. that yeah, well, it's great to see this new resource, which looks like it must have taken quite a quite a lot of um, time and effort to, to put together. But before we come to it, tell, tell us about your story, Mary Jo, again, for those who don't know it, because you were an atheist at one time. Tell us tell us what that period was like for you and what happened uh, that started to draw you towards the Christian faith. Yeah, thank you for asking about that. Uh, so I didn't grow up with a Christian background. I didn't. I wasn't taken to church growing up, or really have like a Christian home. Um, so, and I would come from a part of the country that is, you know, different from the southern United States, where it's very culturally Christian. Um, our area was more post-Christian in the Pacific Northwest. So, um, my background wasn't steeped in cultural Christianity. Uh, but what what I did have was I did have sort of. Um, my family was very curious about science and nature and they were involved in the arts. And so I was exposed to a lot of great beauty and wonder at the world in which I lived. And my in my last year of my high school education, my music teacher uh, witnessed to me and gave me a Bible. And so when you go off to college, I hope you, you know, you're going to have hard questions. So I hope you'll turn to this. So I did start to read the Bible and question, you know, um, where what this was all for and the meaning of <laughs> and value to life. And so he kind of hit me at just the right time when I was having these questions. And when I went off to college, I began to explore faith. And it was in college where I came to know and trust Christ as my savior. But um, when, it, I mean, from the very first day that I'm going into church to profess that I have found Jesus and that I trusted in him, I experienced judgmentalism about how I look and uh, that didn't stop. Like the the patterns of behaviors I saw from believers uh, were very antithetical to the teachings of Jesus that actually drew me to the faith and drew me to mm. church. So that caused some questioning about my faith and I went looking for answers, hope. And I actually, at that point, the point where I was really searching and digging into uh, the Christian faith and the evidence for it, I was sort of hoping Christianity wasn't true <laughs> so I could leave this community of hypocrisy and, um, you know, hurt the things that had hurt me. Mm. And my I found that I couldn't get past um, belief in God. I found that the reasons and evidence led me to belief in God, not away from it. And so that was when I understood that the hypocrisy of Christians couldn't be the litmus test for the truth of Christianity. So where I'm at now um, is I am an, a professor of apologetics and I've written some books and Bible studies. And I, at this point, I have to understand how to engage the church 
knowing that they are just people full of vice and sin mm. who are on their own journeys towards Christ-likeness. And that's sort of like the point that I, I speak a lot on deconstruction and things like that. Yeah, that is one of the big buzzwords of, of our day, isn't it? And I know that the first episode especially deals with that. I mean, just before we leap into that, you were a, a sort of student at the time that you were finding your faith and, and so on, despite, you know, some of the challenges you encountered as well to that. Um, I noticed that these videos, the darkroom videos, seem to be aimed at a similar sort of age group. Um, I guess that that is very often an age when people are kind of deciding, aren't they, what they believe about life. Um, I, I think the reality is probably people kind of get more set in their beliefs as they get older and it's probably harder maybe to convince someone to change their mind to, to have an open mind to a different perspective you know once they reach a certain age I don't know so so that I guess there's a value in in kind of encouraging young people to think about these issues at that point you know the kind of point where you were where you were being asked to think about it yeah absolutely I think that's the time when you feel uh, that you have the space for open exploration of your idea of what you believe and why you believe it. And I think that's, you know, it's been long considered that sort of journey, um, the college journey, the finding yourself. Um, so yeah, it is a time when I think we do need to pay attention to what our students are grappling with. And not just college, but also the high school age, which our series is very much focused on that, like high school to mm. entering college age. Mm, yeah. So, um, Generally speaking, do, do where do you see this resource being deployed? Um, is it is it something that I guess youth groups could use in churches? Uh, something that could be used in student settings and so on. Sure. Yeah, Darkroom Faith is a, a series of fourteen apologetics videos, and it comes with a free curriculum, including so, so a social media like press kit kind of thing. So it's it's going to give you videos to show with your youth group. Um, or your student ministry. And then it's going to give you the leader guide and the student guides as well to be able to work through the material. Uh, and so it would be great to use at large group settings, even small group settings. Uh, you can use it with your own children, in fact, or grandchildren. So I think it's going to be very impacting in, in for all of our Gen Z youth. Mm. Well, why don't we listen to a little bit of um, the first episode of this 14 episode series, uh, and this first episode deals with the issue you just raised, doubt and deconstruction. Here's, here's a little segment. It's probably a year ago when I saw that video. It was called My Deconversion from Christianity. And before I could fully process what that even meant, it started autoplay. I grew up in a Christian home, in the Christian subculture. And I want you to know, when I left home, I realized everything I thought I knew about Jesus was a lie. Creation, sin, hell, salvation, it's all a myth. That video shook me. And I didn't even watch all of it. I was worried I'd be affected by it. And if I followed, I'd lose my faith. So I was like, whoa, nope. Close video. So there you go. You get a, you get a sense there of the nature of of it. It's uh, it's obviously it's filmed very well, Mary Jo. It's very striking that there's obviously a lot of production value has gone into this. Um, obviously, you you wanted to create something that that kind of stands up against you know the Netflixes of this world and that sort of thing. It, it looks like is that is that right? Yeah, and I wish I could take credit for that, but I'm not that creative. <laughs> That's a group called Ox Creates, and they do they are a world class production company who partnered with us. And so that's them, <laughs> not me. Uh, it would be great to go check them out as well, Ox Creates. And, but we did really want to pay attention to the aesthetic quality of the videos that we were producing, knowing that Gen Z is very influenced mm. by that sort of high production value. Yeah. And, and wh where did the stories and the scripting and the kind of the idea for these different sort of vignettes, if you like, that each, each video represents come from? So we did a uh, ca sort of like a casting call for Gen Z student narratives about uh, their struggles in the faith. 
and we receive stories from all of the, all over the United States. So each vignette, each narrative that you see in the videos actually represents a real student's story and what they're actually struggling with. Struggling with. Sometimes we even use their own words. Um, so you're actually seeing like, base, it says based on true stories, that's what it is. And we went through them and we, you know, paired them with some of the bigger subjects like doubt and suffering and uh, so that we could produce these series. Yeah. Well, this one on doubt and, and deconstruction sort of begins with someone who's obviously come across stuff online that started to make them question their faith and so on. Um, I mean, that you, you must see that all the time. Uh, to, to what extent, you know, is that the key place uh, where where young people, if they are a Christian, maybe have grown up in the church where they begin to to have doubts sown in, in that sense. And and what's the sort of, where, where, where do you begin with young people who are facing that kind of skepticism online? Ah, oh, yeah, that's a good one. I don't have any statistics on like, how are they encountering, um, you know, imagery and thoughts that are disrupting their faith in God, but I'm pretty sure we're comfortable saying a lot of it's happening online. So, uh, cause they, they have more access to the internet. They're the, di the digitally native generation and they constantly have the internet with them at all times. So, um, that's that's part of the problem is that they're exposed to all this really i mean a lot of times it's really good quality mm -hmm. uh, videos or very authentic deconversion stories and so that might be the first time they come across something like this and it really rocks them because they haven't heard these subjects in their church or from their youth group and they haven't you know some some youth groups they don't even know what apologetics is or that there is a a study of how to of, of giving reasons for the faith um, and of answering objections that have come up. They don't even know the great history mm. of the Christian tradition of answering these objections. So I think it's important to, you know, where do we start with them, with these students? This is a good resource. You know, you can actually watch the videos with your own, um, your own child or with your youth group and, and then go through some of the materials with them and ask them what kind of questions this brings up for them or ask them, have you encountered this already somewhere else, you know, somewhere online and see if they can relate to it? Because I think they can, from what I understand, they've, they've seen these kinds of things like um, in the doubt video when he watches a my deconversion story. And uh, it's pretty strong calling Chris everything. She says everything she uh, was told about Christianity was a lie. And so that's very powerful, mm. especially when it's coming from a place of authenticity and rawness. So we need to engage that and help students work through that. I think one strategy that's been tried but probably has failed is to sort of simply screen off all sources of skepticism and doubt and deconstruction from young people. And, you know, that that strategy only lasts as long as you have control over devices or anything else. Um, and, and I've seen so many young people's faith seem to suddenly evaporate when they go out on their own and they're suddenly left to the you know they have to face those challenges and they haven't just they just haven't been given the opportunity to talk through it with others and to prepare themselves for that so so what's your advice i suppose to th the fact is people you know young christians will encounter that kind of material it's it's bound to happen what how can we best prepare young people then to to kind of face up to those challenges and sort of meet them you know in a way that hopefully doesn't shipwreck their own faith because they haven't sort of met any of these arguments or stories before yeah i think one of the best things that you can do as a christian leader or just as an older christian is to bring to the conversation your own educating self like your own learning self transforming self is that you yourself are engaging these questions and talking about where maybe you have had some doubt in the past so that they can see that like specifically what we're trying to do with the doubt episode is to help them see that doubt is not, you're not on the fringe. Like this is normal. People have doubts because we're human and we don't have all knowledge. So as a, as an adult or as somebody who's a leader in these circumstances, just to bring that realness that you yourself have had questions about certain things and that you're learning, you're excited to discover what those answers are. I think that's very powerful for our students because they need models. They need mentors who are modeling this type of learning. Like, hey, let's go get the answers together. So I think that's one of the best ways that you can help students. And then, you know, using material and content that helps to answer these hard questions. Um, even all of the work that you're doing, Justin, you have so many resources available to people to help students work through these issues. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to the specific issues, there can be any number of reasons why people ultimately have deconstructed or, you know, uh, lost their faith for one reason or another. I mean, 
one one issue that kind of gets brought up in the video is was Moses high on DMT when you know he was at the burning bush you know there's lots of theories you know some some more more reasonable than others as to how the bible came together about you know uh, you you will run into just about every theory you can think of you know if you look long enough on on the internet and i suppose it's difficult to know how to to deal with that because it's not like you can give an answer to every single objection that exists out there so so what i don't know what's your strategy mary joe for kind of helping young people especially to kind of prepare for any myriad of of possible objections that might come their way through the internet Oh yeah, that's a good question. I um, sort of take an educational approach in that we need to discover, you know, where is this coming from? What's its source? What are the kinds of questions these are bringing up in your own life? Um, I, I like to ask questions like, well, what do you mean? What, where are you getting this from? Those kinds of questions. And then help them reason through um, responses. There, there are some arguments out there that are not very good arguments, but they don't know that because they're not usually taught how to do logic and how to uh, reason through the arguments. Uh, sometimes people make you know, fallacious statements, either in the form of their argument or in the content. And if you say that to a student, they don't even know what that is. So I want to I think it's really important to help them understand how to reason well, how to think well. So that's the approach that I take. Well, let's reason through this together. Let's look at, you know, where is this coming from? Is that an authoritative source? Is that a credible source? Mm -hmm. Is it good? And what kind of evidence are they providing? What kind of evidence are we looking for? What you know, those kinds of questions to help them encounter good thinking skills um, so that they can encounter these arguments well. I mean, it strikes me that deconstruction also isn't just necessarily an intellectual issue. Um, obviously, that is a significant component of it for many people. But the more that I've kind of interacted with people who are kind of deconstructing from maybe some kind of evangelical faith, and deconstructing doesn't always mean losing their faith completely necessarily. But but I, I, I get the sense that sometimes people are also reacting or responding to a certain type of church culture, maybe uh, a certain, you know, sort of very um button down very maybe restrictive almost um form of church culture which then then kind of pushing against because because of its restrictions and so on and sometimes people do throw the whole thing out not realizing that there's more than just the one church culture they were presented with that exists out there is, is that your experience yeah yeah definitely and you know that's sort of my own story it was i'm i was basing my my doubt was sort of coming out of an emotional doubt based on my experiences in the church. And I was experiencing one kind of church culture. So when we look at like people who say they're deconstructing, we're dealing with, um, we're dealing with an umbrella term of, um, you know, what does that mean to each of these different people? So some people are getting rid of some of the church traditions that they uh, don't think are uh, good, that they don't think come from the Bible. Uh, they think they are additions to the gospel or, you know, those sorts of things. But other people, you know, you have the other spectrum where they're just leaving the entire, uh, they're leaving their faith behind. And many times it is because they've had very hurtful experiences in the church. And I don't want to downplay that as an excuse, you know, like, oh, well, they're just leaving because of these hurtful experiences. I mean, this is trauma in some people's lives. And so the thought of coming back into church fellowship can be very mm -hmm. triggering for them. So there's a psychological element to this as well. And I think that's why it's so important what Paul says in like 1 Corinthians 13, at the very front end of that, where he talks about if you have all you know, faith that can move mountains, if you have all knowledge, but if you don't have love, you're nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. And we need to really embrace that as a church to be objectively loving while also, you know, providing objective truth that these things can't be separate from each other because it's causing a lot of harm mm. when we when we separate them. Sorry, <laughs> make sure I make that clear. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. Ab absolutely. And do you, I mean, in your experience, you know, may, maybe we're still only at the front end of this sort of quote unquote deconstruction movement, but have you seen people come through that have you seen people who who have sort of managed to forge away reconstruct even after they've deconstructed and that kind of thing oh yeah well that'd be my own story <laughs> i have been <laughs> reconstructing and figuring out how how should i engage the church you know because i i'm not willing to give up on her because i know that she and we have well there's an episode on that there's the church episode about what is it for and I still believe that the church is the family of God. We're adopted into this family. And so even though she's <laughs> horribly flawed, um, what I'm seeing people do, as, and in myself as well, is 
figure out how am I going to engage the church in a more responsible manner, knowing that I can love everybody, but the levels of trust should be um, in congruence with what they've demonstrated in their own Christian maturity, right? So um, I think sometimes we don't, we don't stress the Christian maturity as a thing that we should be looking for in our leaders and in our church congregations. Well, thank you so much for, for talking to me in this episode of, of the show, Mary Jo, and um, look forward to catching up next time as we look at another one of these videos in this Dark Room Faith series. Uh, again, if folk want to go and check it out, it's it's there now. Uh, it's, you know, you can go and watch the videos. Uh, you can check out the resources uh, and they really are excellently produced, really, really good quality. It's so good to see such such well crafted videos and resources being made available um uh apologetics has really you know come of age i feel uh, when you've got these kinds of things being made available so darkroomfaith.com is the place to go but we look forward to exploring some more of the resources in uh, the next time we talk but for now mary joe thank you very much for being with me today thanks for having me unapologetic from premier unbelievable for more shows resources and our newsletter visit premierunbelievable.com